Hey guys, welcome back to Sports Spectrum. We are the intersection of sports and faith here. I am Jason Romano and really excited today to welcome Lucas Black to Sports Spectrum. He loves Jesus. He's an actor and you've seen him in, gosh, you've seen him in roles for many years, especially in NCIS New Orleans. Uh, he's been in Fast and Furious films. He's got a cameo in the new film coming out F9, Fast and Furious 9 as Sean Boswell. And you saw him in 42, which I happened to be watching a couple of weeks ago and remember that he played Pee Wee Reese in the 42 movie, the Jackie Robinson movie with Chadwick Boseman, which is pretty cool to welcome Lucas Black here to the show today. He's also an Alabama guy too. Hey, Lucas, welcome to the show. How are you? Fantastic, appreciate you having me on, Jason. It's good Absolutely. to be here. Great to have you here, my friend. And it's funny, I was doing research and saw that you grew up in a place called Speak, Alabama. So let's start there. Where is Speak, Alabama? That's right. It's in the uh, backwoods of Alabama. <laughs> it's uh, a <laughs> northwest, you know, portion of Alabama, about 30 minutes west of uh, Huntsville. And okay. uh, yeah, that's where I grew up. Small rural town, just a uh, normal Alabama boy playing sports and, and growing up outside and outdoors. Okay. So playing sports, growing up outside, outdoors, and you turn right. into and, and eventually have opportunities to become an actor. I'm guessing there aren't a lot of I speak know. Alabama people that, you know, showed up and, and ended up in major motion pictures and, you know, television shows watched by hundreds of millions of people. So let's go back to the childhood a little bit, Lucas, and talk us through that outdoors, Lucas Black, that, that sports fan and that sports athlete, because you played, I know you played high school football. I'm not sure about other sports, but where does sort of all of that intersect with, eventually going into acting because I know you were 11 years old when you were in your first film yeah that's right so uh yeah like I said you know just normal Alabama boy growing up playing sports I played uh you know basketball football baseball and then my last two years in high school I played golf uh, my junior and senior year um but yeah you know I didn't even know there was such a thing as acting you know growing up uh, everything we watched on tv was uh, sports and outdoor right. shows and uh, I did watch Old Yeller and Davy Crockett but pretty much everything I saw on TV you know I thought was real I didn't know uh, there was a thing called acting and my mom she heard about an open audition on the radio and it was for the movie The War and um, she heard Kevin Costner was going to be in it so Really, I think she took me to the audition because she thought maybe Kevin Costner was going to be there. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, she just knew from my personality that, um, you know, I would I wouldn't be scared to be, you know, myself and just act naturally. So uh, the casting directors went all over the southeast, um, you know, and had open calls. There were 11 characters in the movie, The War, and, and John Abnett was the director, and he wanted uh, kids that never acted before. So they came to Coleman uh, Civic Center, which is, you know, uh, right there close to where I grew up. And um, they called us in a room. There was about, I don't know, 5,000 kids there. And they called us in in like groups of 50. And uh, they asked everybody, you know, tell us your name, your age, how old you were, you know, where, where you live. And um, most of the kids were saying their address, you know, uh, when, and when it got to me, they said, okay, tell us, tell us where you live. And I said, well, you go down 157 and in speak, we had a, a service station, one of those service stations where you can buy everything, right? You've got your hardware, you can, you can buy your groceries, anything you want was yeah. at this service station. And so, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the pinnacle of the whole community. And so I'm like, you go, you go by Mickey Wiggins store. And that was the name of it, Mickey Wiggins. And you turn left, you know, and they're like, we need you to read some lines, kid. <laughs> <laughs> just because, uh, just because I said something different than everybody else. Right. So, wow. And so you get so that's how, that's how it kind of Costner. started. It's, in, it's insane that's right. to be with a guy that's and right. speaking so that of, was, go ahead. Yeah. So that was my first, first audition. You know, and uh, and I end up getting the part, and um, so then I had another audition for a, a television show called American Gothic, which was in North Carolina. So after after I got uh, the first part uh, in the war, I got a small agent in North Carolina, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, 
and um, they got me an audition on this television show called American Gothic. And when I went to that audition, I remember still today, um, I was 12 years old at the time. And I go in this, in this building, in this office building, and all these kids are lined up, like in the hallway, reading, reading their script, reading their lines, and it's real quiet, and they're all looking nervous and, and uh, you know, timid. And not the, all the, like, stage moms were there, and I'm like, this is, this is strange. Like, what are these kids doing, you know? Yeah. And I go in and have the meeting with the director. Um, and when I'm done meeting, I go back outside. And so in South Carolina, they had these huge, or this was in North Carolina, I'm sorry, huge live oak trees, right, all along the coast. And uh, I didn't have those growing up in northern Alabama. So I go outside, and I'm climbing on these huge live oak trees. Well, the director, he sees me outside, and he's like, Who, who's that kid? Whoever that is, that's who I want to play the part. And so that got me the audition in front of uh, CBS, they, uh, the network, and uh, I ended up getting that part. And so it was just kind of like, since I didn't know anything about acting, uh, didn't have any fear of man, I was just being a normal kid. And that pretty much got me, you know, two roles in my, at the start of my career. So that was pretty fascinating. Wow, that is an amazing story. And it's interesting too, Lucas, because at the same time, you're trying to navigate being this, you know, kid, right, who's in Alabama. And, you know, I'm guessing you started to become like, maybe, maybe I'm wrong on this, but you probably started to become the cool kid. Like, hey, he was in that movie and he was in this, Lucas. And you're trying to still navigate being like a normal teenager as well. What was that time like as you started to have a little bit of whatever you want to call it, notoriety and some opportunities to be seen by a lot of people in these movies, but yet still go back to Alabama and have a as, as close to a normal life as you could. But. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, when I look back on it, I'm so thankful and grateful that uh, we lived where we lived in, in, a, in a small town and, um, and growing up in a Christian home because really when, we, when I was done working and went back to – normal life if you want to call it um we didn't nobody treated me any different right and i didn't think of it any differently um so i think i think that had a lot to do with it i didn't talk about it much um you know i wasn't really you know impressed or starstruck with movies in general uh I didn't really like watching movies, to be honest, because it took so much time, you know, that I'd rather be outside playing or playing ball. And so, uh, so when I went back to speak, you know, I was still the normal kid. It wasn't like, oh, you know, I wasn't bragging and boasting like, look at me, I've been on TV, because I really didn't care. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think that had a lot to do with it. And the kids, you know, treated me, treated me just the same as, it, it, you know, well, I feel like if I hadn't been in any shows and also, you know, I'm, I'm thankful my parents, uh, we really wanted to, uh, they, they really wanted me to experience a, a normal life, you know, going to school and uh, playing sports and having a community and going to church on Sundays. So it wasn't like um, my work schedule as a child, they, they didn't really push me to work all the time, like movie after movie after movie. I mean, pretty much I did one a year after I, after I uh, started the war, I would do like one movie a year all the way up and pretty much until I was, I was a senior. And then when I graduated, you know, and went straight to work, I started doing more. But um, so I'm, I'm just thankful that uh, growing up and grounded in a Christian home and also in Speak Alabama, where it's a small community to have uh, true friends and relationships that, uh, help kept, you know, keep me grounded and uh, just to enjoy uh, a normal life growing up as a child. Lucas Black is joining us here, uh, the actor on Sports Spectrum. Uh, we intersect the conversation with faith and sports. You mentioned growing up in a Christian home. I have to imagine the influence that had on your journey all the way to today on um, being a man of faith, a man who loves Jesus. And also sports being a big part of that as well, as you mentioned when you were in high school. Can you kind of talk about that, that faith journey a little bit and kind of where that took shape and how it kind of plays out for you, even as, you know, as it is today? Yeah, absolutely. 
absolutely. So, you know, as a, as a child, um, you know, my parents were intentional about going to church and taking us, um, you know, to church every Sunday. And so, um, I, you know, I was five years old when I, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, um, you know, and then obviously throughout my life, or I shouldn't say obviously, but I, I strayed from God, uh, sure. you know, disobeyed when I got older and uh, tried to do things on my own. You know, I think uh, there was a, um, you know, time of my, in my life where um, I feel like I, I wanted to control things, right? And so, um, and so it wasn't really until about 2015, um, six years ago, till I rededicated my life and really started digging into my Bible, right? There were some, uh, there were some things that I had to uh, figure out uh, what God's word said about uh, teachings. You know, I grew up, you know, in Alabama, which is uh, the Bible Belt, and uh, so every denomination was in was in five, you know, within five miles of my home. Yeah. And then uh, my wife, she grew up uh, Catholic, and so there was a lot of, you know, and I went to uh, church with her when I met her in my twenties, and so there was a lot of different teachings right, that I heard, and so I really had to dig into God's word to figure out, to really ask him what his truth was, and, and ask him to reveal it to me, and, um, and so that's when my relationship really started growing uh, in Christ, and uh, it, you know, it had a lot to do with uh, the season of life I was in, having children, I wanted, I wanted them to uh, grow up in a church family and in a church home where there was clarity, right? I uh, didn't, especially uh, on the topic of salvation, right? I, I think we, you know, we're hungry to have a, um, um, to be secure and sure in our salvation, right? Sure. And so, um, so that was important to me as a spiritual leader of our, of our home and of my family that, um, that, I wanted to. I wanted to make sure I was in a church family that was a, a Bible teaching church, and a, 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 a church home that was clear on what salvation uh, is. To you know that the word the word of God says about salvation. So that's um, that's kind of my journey. And, and um, you know it was funny because um, you have you have these beliefs right, and I and I really never was intentional about sitting down and reading the Bible. So it wasn't until I really made a commitment to like, I'm going to read this. Um, that way I can defend my faith and, and be sure, uh, you know, about what God's word says, you know, and I had, I had help too, you know, I, I um, would call my pastors and call uh, godly men that, you know, for counsel, I had counsel in my life. So, uh, you know, I'm just grateful for that over the over these past uh, six years here in New Orleans. Tell me about, and I'm sure, well, maybe you're not asked this question a lot, but what is it like to, I guess, to be completely blunt, like be a Christian in Hollywood, right? And I think you said you kind of had some moments where you stray away, which is, by the way, very common uh, as a person who worked at a place like ESPN for many years, as I did. Um, you know, I was a Christian while I was working there, but I certainly had my priorities out of whack. I certainly was chasing after success and fame and uh, climbing the corporate ladder during my time. What was that like for you kind of navigating that world? And then you said it was 2015. You still did the show uh, and CIS New Orleans for a few more years. Um, what was that like kind of walking through being a believer and walking through being, you know, an actor in Hollywood and what that was like? Well, yeah, it's a good question. You know, I think there were many stages, um, or many different seasons um, of my growth in Christ, you know, throughout my career. Uh, number one, I would say the biggest issue is, um, you know, wh where your identity is, right? So when you're, you're an actor in the entertainment business, and uh, this goes for other, other industries as well, especially athletes, I think uh, yeah. it's, it's very similar you're, you're, you're put on a pedestal pretty much, or you look, or you feel like you are, you know, it's kind of like a lot of people in the entertainment business have this perception that everybody wants their job, right? 
you know, uh, you know, they, they glorify you, uh, you're on the screen, you know, you're getting a lot of attention, you're getting a lot of praise. And, um, and so there's a lot of things that can happen there to an individual, right? It can put a lot of uh, expectation. We can get caught up in it and think that that's who we are, right? And, um, and so that's one thing I had to deal with, right? Because, um, um, you know, my identity is in Christ sure. and, and him alone. You know, I'm a child of God. Uh, you know, I act for a living, but that's, that doesn't define me, you know? And so um, I think that's the, that's the first thing that uh, personally, you know, it, you know, is a struggle being in the entertainment business. And, um, you know, two, uh, the second thing that you're going to get, you know, you're going to, there's going to be some persecution when you're, when you're in the entertainment business, when you're working in Hollywood, um, you know, and it's known that you're a Christian um, and you start professing your faith, there's going to be some people that, that don't like that. And it's not really, I've learned that uh, we shouldn't take it personally as Christians because yeah. it's, it's the word of God that really uh, convicts, you know, convicts. It, it's kind of like, that's, that's what the issue is, you know, that, that, that people have the issue with. But um, so you can, I can feel that tension, right? When I'm in the entertainment business, and I'm working and it's known that I'm a Christian, you know, the opportunity comes up. It's, it, it was amazing, you know, working on set, just, a, just a story about uh, talking about God on set, you know, yeah. uh, once I did that, you know, other Christians would come and, and talk to me, right. Other fellow believers would come and talk to me. And I noticed that usually when we're at work, they'll come up and kind of whisper, right. Kind of keep it quiet, sure. you know? And so I started thinking about it. Cause I, cause I would just talk normal. I would try to make a point to just talk normal. I have nothing to hide. You know, Jesus has freed me from all shame. So I'm, so I'm just going to uh, profess his name whenever the opportunity comes up. And, um, and I understand why they whisper because you can feel the tension of the persecution. Um, but what was what I want to say is to encourage anybody out there that may be feeling that is that uh, God allows that to happen to build our faith, right? It caused me to dig in to God's word. It caused me to uh, seek him and, and, you know, find the answers in the, in the Bible and really just trust him and, uh, you know, share my testimony with people and um, to speak the truth in love, right? Because it's like your story, your testimony, whatever it is, no one can really argue with that. How you come to Christ, what he's done for you and how he saved you and become your Lord and Savior, you know, uh, no one can really dispute that. That's right. You know? And so that's, that's, uh, that's what it caused me to do. Um, and so those two things, you know, is, is I think really important to um, uh, recognize in any industry, but, you know, we got to make sure our identity is in Christ and then realize that, um, you know, there's, there's going to be some, some persecution and we just have to dig in and, and stand strong in the Lord. Lucas, I want to ask you about, uh, especially the last few years, cause it was 15, I said 2015 when you, or you said that you had to kind of rededicate or kind of came back and started to explore your relationship deeper. So as that happens, what did discipleship, what did staying connected to the Lord look like when you're working, when you're on set? Obviously, you're there to do a job, so you're not walking around with a, well, maybe not, with a cross on your shirt and a Bible in your hand every time. You're, you're hired to do a job, but you still want to have that relationship and connect with the Lord. What did that look like? Did you have like a, a discipleship partner or somebody to kind of pour into you? Were you kind of on your own doing this? Was there some people on staff? What did that look like? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, um, you know, it took some, you know, really sitting down and thinking about who my friends were. I mean, basically, I had my pastor on speed dial, you know, mm -hmm. but two of them, actually. 
because, uh, you know, I needed that, right? I needed to, anytime I was dealing with something, you know, I had to call my pastor, text him, and then also just um, uh, really seeking godly friends, godly men, godly counsel. And uh, I'm so thankful at our church, you know, they're, they, they place a big importance on discipleship. And so they're really good about connecting people in small groups. And um, we have, we have a, a Wednesday morning discipleship training, so to speak. It's, called, it's a men's breakfast. Mm. And so just staying involved in uh, my church activities, church family, and uh, really developing a relationship you know, with my pastors, um, you know, I just opening up, swallowing, swallowing my pride a little bit and letting them know that, you know, I need help. You know, I can't do it. I can't do it alone. And, uh, you know, if they're good godly leaders, they understand, you know, and, and they're going to be there willing to help. So, um, you know, fortunately, I think, you know, the, uh, God spoke to me because I remember having the conversation with my wife uh, when we moved here to New Orleans that we need to be intentional about finding godly friends, surrounding ourselves with believers in Christ. And, mm. um, you know, we did that. And, and we're so thankful now. Like, uh, that, that's one of the reasons why we're still here. The main reason why we're still here in New Orleans is because um, the friendships we developed um in our church family and 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 the friendships that god's put together in our lives is just amazing and and um you know i couldn't have done it without them there's no way there's no way i would have lasted 125 episodes on ncis new orleans without without my uh you know godly friends and and godly leaders here in new orleans it must have been a, a unique role too where you're living in the city where you're shooting your show so in many ways, you're probably able to just go home at night to be with your family or whenever time that you could be with your family, you would go home and be with them, which is very different, I would imagine, from most of what would look like normal Hollywood or being on a show That's right. because That's right. you're probably in L.A. or filming somewhere and then you got to go travel back home. You could literally get in a car and drive home at night or during the day or whenever you weren't filming, I would imagine, right? Yeah, that's right. That's one of, that was a big blessing um you know doing the television show because when i did a television series so i i was 13 when i did my first television show uh, american gothic and that was the audition i was telling you about where i was climbing the tree yeah. um that was a tough schedule for a 13 year old because it was a lot of night shoots i mean my mom had to sign a waiver um every day pretty much uh, for me to shoot after hours as a minor, um, you know, we weren't, I wasn't earning a lot at that time. Uh, you know, a lot of it's put away into a trust when you're 18. So, you know, we were scraping by. And um, so I, after that, I said, I'm not going to do TV again. Right. <laughs> and so doing movies, the, the rest of my career, I did, you know, I did film. And when I got married and had the first child, I shot 42. That was the first first movie that I filmed after we had our first child. And uh, my wife came with me, and, and our and our daughter came with me, which I was grateful for. It was, it was a wonderful uh, season in my life. But we traveled to like four or five different cities, and we carried the house. Right? It's our first child, so we had everything. I'm talking about pack and play, toys, high chair, you name it. And um, and I'm like, man, am I, am I going to be doing this? You know, am I going to be traveling around acting with and raising a family for the rest of my life? You know, there are already concerns uh, that I had observed, uh, you know, in the entertainment industry that I was worried about, I guess, you know, uh, being an actor and raising a family. But I'm like, man, this is tough. So, yes, being able to have a home base here in New Orleans, you know, and come home home every day to the family and somewhat have like a normal schedule working schedule to be able to sleep in your own bed and have your family here was a huge blessing um and that's one reason why we uh, stayed in it as long as we did 
Lucas Black is our guest here on Sports Spectrum, the intersection of sports and faith. I am Jason Romano. I want to ask you, you alluded to the movie 42. You played the role of Pee Wee Reese. That movie's on all the time, especially around this time of year as baseball is back and um, in April celebrating Jackie Robinson month. So I got to watch it. I was on an airplane. Reese. I've seen it probably six or seven times. I even rem remember when we were at ESPN and we were doing initial press and we had Chadwick Boseman and Harrison Ford on our sports center show at that time when I was working there to promote it. So it's, it's been on the top of mind for a lot of people. I thought it was so well done. Give me your experience and the opportunity of to be in a movie like that and uh, play a character as a sports guy, to be able to play a baseball player going back into the forties and kind of be a part of something pretty iconic. Take us through what that experience was like. You kind of alluded to it from your family perspective, but just being in a movie, putting on that Brooklyn Dodger uniform, it had to be such a cool throw. Yes. Uh, yeah, that was a unique, you know, experience. And when you get the script uh, of a project like that and you read it, you know, that's one of those that, um, you know, you hope you get to be a part of, right? And so I was honored to be able to get that role uh, of Pee Wee Reese, you know, and have such a pivotal scene in the movie where, um, you know, it was a shift. It was a shift in perspective from from all the you know the racial tension and abuse that Jackie was getting that uh, you know finally some somebody on the team was stepping out and making a public display that hey he he should be you know treated like the rest of us you know he's a teammate like the rest of us and 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 we you know Pee Ree Reese um, you know I love the saying that um, you know we judge people of, of of their character, Martin Luther King, the content of their character, not the color of their skin, you know? Yeah. And so that's what Pee Ree Reese was doing in that scene, you know, that, um, you know, he was kind of the one that was uh, staying quiet before, you know, wasn't, wasn't really making a fuss about it, just wanting to go out and play ball. And, and, uh, uh, and so he, had, there was a point, you know, it finally it reached where, uh, he felt a little pressure, right? He was feeling a little pressure and worried about his business back home. And then, uh, you know, Branch Rickey said, oh, yeah, well, look, look at here. It was, a, it was a scene where, you know, um, Jackie Robinson had a thousand letters of, you know, racial slurs and threats and death threats. And, uh, you know, that was, that was when Pee Ree Reese realized that, uh, you know, well, he, he's going through it too. There's, it's not, I can't stay quiet any longer, right? Yeah. I've got to let my family know. I've got to let my hometown know that, hey, Jackie, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, treat him as a, as an equal, and um, and so it's a powerful moment in the movie. And so for me to play that character was, um, you know, I was just honored, man, honored to be a part of that whole story, honored to be a part of that movie, and it was a special time. Uh, you know, and, and doing a period piece, you know, is, is, is fun. We embraced, you know, um, the music of the forties and just looking at pictures and, and the style, it's not really something, you know, style is not something I care about in my personal life, yeah. but like looking at what they wear in the forties, you know, that that's cool. My wife loves that kind of stuff. So we had a fun, we had fun, you know, researching together and, um, and like you said, also, you know, it being a baseball fan, you know, I loved playing baseball growing up. And um, it was just awesome to be able to go out with all the other actors and, uh, and baseball players. They hired baseball players to, you know, to do some of the scenes mm -hmm. and uh, play ball together. Man, it was, you know, a lot of the camaraderie we had and it was just great to be able to work out with those guys and, and uh, eat dinner with them. And uh, we felt like a team, you know, the Brooklyn Dodgers. We felt like a team uh, while we were filming. And so that was, that was a cool experience. And to be able to work with Chad, man, he, he was a hard worker. He, he didn't take uh, any of that, you know, movie for granted. He, he, he dug deep and worked hard in every area of that movie and, and done a phenomenal job. I was, I was uh, uh, proud of how it turned out. So. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Appreciate you asking about it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a big fan of the movie and obviously Chad, you know, taken from us too soon last year and just watching his journey and his career. I was curious when you make a movie like that as a player, do you have to go through like a de facto training camp or preseason to, you know, not that you didn't know how to play baseball, but do they put you yes. through a little bit of the grinder of having to learn how to field a ground ball in a proper way or swing in the bat? Do you have to kind of go through that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, especially for 42 because the uniform, right, is made out of wool. The gloves are super small. I mean, it's, it's almost like a, a training mitt that right. you have today you know i mean it doesn't even go past the fingers that much and so and there's hardly any padding so you have to have soft hands and really try to feel you want to feel the ball in the pocket uh because anywhere else you feel the ball who knows where it's going it's gonna so, hurt uh, so <laughs> that's right and the cleats like we wore the authentic cleats um which were I mean, they were nails in the shoes and you had like wooden planks. So they're digging. I, I remember when we were training, I think we trained pretty much on the field every day for like two weeks. Mm. And um, I taped up my taped up my feet every single day because those cleats, I mean, they were just nothing, no, no padding, just uh, blocks, you know, and nails in them and uh, a little bitty leather strap that goes over your, over your foot. So uh yeah you know that was a lot to get used to um and um you know and it was fun too that's that's a time where you know you can bond with the guys and uh and really feel like a team and uh, i think it showed in the movie so that was that was cool it did it was very authentic and i thought the movie was so well done last couple of questions here with lucas black as we wind down i want to ask you about this youtube channel um, that I just happened to stumble upon as I'm doing my research and it's hunting and fishing and you started it right. It looks like right before COVID hit, but then you kept it going. And I saw recently you released a video and you're kind of out there showing me how to, you know, how you, um, I think it's how you, uh, I don't even know the word, but you had a catfish, I think, or some kind of fish and you were, you were, you know, skill, skinning it and yeah, yeah cutting it yeah. through it just to make fillet, get ready to fillet to put it on the grill. I was like, yeah. this is fascinating to me. So what what was the uh, mindset behind starting this YouTube video? Yeah, well, that's a good question. You know, uh, it first started off as a way to build, um, you know, a platform to market. I had a, I had an idea in the fishing industry um, that uh, you know I was a product that I was wanting to sell, but then as we you know got started and it and it started building, I. Um, you know, it was just a fun experience to be able to use um, my kids in the projects, you know, and, and film our outdoor adventures and show my family life. I think people uh, really uh, like seeing, you know, just uh, spending the time outdoors, having a good time with the kids and really connecting with, uh, with my children, you know. And, um, and so I try to do a little bit of teaching, you know, in the videos. You know, I grew up hunting and fishing, um, and so I try to do, uh, uh, you know, some instructional videos, and then also just just showing a uh, a different way of life, right? I think, um, um, you know, life now is really busy, and uh, you know, I've I tried I tried to be conscious of slowing myself down, especially in the entertainment industry, because it it's you know ninety miles an hour, yeah, and. Um, try to get on God's pace, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I feel like I do that when I'm outdoors uh, fishing, uh, really connecting with my heavenly father and his creation that, you know, that he created for our enjoyment. And so, um, you know, and it's been fun to capture those moments on film and just to, uh, just to share with people. Um, you know, I think also it's, a, it's a, you know, different source of entertainment, right? Yeah. Nowadays, nowadays we get to choose, we have the opportunity to choose what we want to watch, you know? So it's good, clean, fun entertainment. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not really something you have to watch for an hour and a half. You can watch a 10 minute video and get some enjoyment out of it, you know? So uh, that's, that's kind of what reason I started it. And, uh, you know, it's been fun. 
That's great. Yeah. And you're also uh, returning to the Fast and Furious series. I know you have a cameo as Sean Boswell with F9. It's coming out this year, June 25th in the theater. So that'll be fun to watch. People can look for that if they go out to the movie theater and maybe get a glimpse of Lucas Black there. Uh, last question. Thank you so much for your time, by the way. You've been so generous. And in a time of uncertainty and division, uh, I feel like Jesus teaches us something uh, vital each and every day. And so my question to you, which is one we ask on this show quite often, what is the Lord teaching you and showing you right now? What's he been kind of impressing on your heart as you've been connecting with him? And certainly in the landscape of 2021 and all that we've kind of been through in the last 15 months, what's he been showing you and teaching you? Yeah, that's good. Good question. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is just the body of Christ. The church is such a good opportunity for us to be to be the light, right? Um, he calls us salt and light of the earth. But um, you know, you you know, you have to you have to. Uh, I heard somebody say the other day, you have to shake the salt, right? Yes. You know, and so and so to me, that means that um, we have to go out, right? We have to go out and be that light. We have to go out and serve. There's tons of people that, that are in need and need help. And um, so we can show the love of Christ by helping those. And also, uh, you know, to be bold and to be to just to share the truth. You know, I think, uh, um, you know, 2020 and just the past couple of years, I just felt like, um, you know, a lot of our uh, freedoms have been kind of, uh, tried to be taken away, you know, a lot of churches have been shut down mm. and, um, you know, that's been disheartening to me. And so uh, I think all of us as a body of Christ really need to uh, step up and be bold in our faith, right? And we can't afford really to, to sit quiet anymore. And, uh, and I shouldn't say anymore, but we, we never could afford to sit quiet, but we need to just uh, um, remember back when they started the first church, you know, in, in Acts, um, when they were, you know, Peter and John were being persecuted for their faith in the synagogues, and and, uh, and um, they wanted them to keep quiet, right? Don't talk about Jesus, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees, and, and uh, he said, who should I obey, man or God, you know? And, yeah. so, uh, and so I just want to encourage all the believers out there and all the Christians out there that, that we need to... Uh, speak the truth and love, right? And uh, be bold and look for opportunities to, uh, you know, pray for people and look for opportunities to just uh, uh, speak your faith and, um, you know, be the salt and light of the earth because uh, it's needed right now. And I think a lot of people um, are searching, you know, they're searching, they, they're, they're looking to be fed spiritually. Um, I think it's one of the things that's being searched the most right now uh, yeah. on the internet. So, um, so that's, that's, that's what the Lord has been putting on my heart is just, uh, you know, we're, we're in a battle, we're in a spiritual battle and uh, it's in the Lord's hands, but he's also called us to face it, right. To go out and face that battle and to be that light and share the gospel. So. Yeah, that's good stuff. He is Lucas Black. You can see him again in the new Fast and Furious movie coming out, F9, June 25th, 2021. You can watch a bunch of reruns, CBS, uh, CBS's NCIS New Orleans. It's it's out there anytime between 2014 and 2019. You can see Lucas Black playing in the Christopher LaSalle character, Special Agent Christopher LaSalle. And uh, this was great, my friend. It's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, nice to connect with you. Nice to learn where Speak Alabama is. And uh, hopefully we'll get you back on sometime and have another conversation. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, sounds good, Jason. Thanks for having me on. Enjoyed it.